Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to take a look at the Armageddon game that decided the match between Alareza Ferruja and Wesley So. I thought the entire match was phenomenal and really interesting, and I recommend you watch it if you haven't already, but especially this game, partly because of the chess. It was a really interesting opening, and it developed into a very strategic but it ended very tactically, so I thought it was an interesting match, but also the context, of course, the winner of this game, or Black, if they draw, will move on and likely face Magnus and Ikaru for the Speed Chess Championship title. So a very interesting game that we have in front of us. Let's dive straight in. It was Wesley So with the white side. He had five minutes, and Alireza Ferruja had three minutes and 39 seconds, but of course the luxury that if the game ends in a draw, it goes his way. So E4, E5, and we develop into an Italian, and it seems like it's going to be a quite a slow Italian, very positional and strategical, but very quickly, this game develops a far more tactical eye, and uh, that sort of begins with this idea for black to go h6 and knight to g4. So in these sort of structures, as is very typical, you have the tension between the bishops, where neither bishop wants to trade itself. If black were to take white's bishop, then although they you know, perhaps ruin the structure, they give white an abundance of pawns in the center, which are very mobile and, you know, very often d4 will follow, but also the open f-file will give white um, a plethora of different attacking chances. Knight g5 is coming, and generally speaking, these structures are not good for black. Alternatively, if it was white that would take the bishop on b6, the a-file opens up, the rook gets active, and not something that white wants to allow. And so what black now does is they want to go knight to g4 and encourage the bishop to trade on b6, but this immediate knight g4 fails because of bishop g5. You have this square, you attack the queen, F f6 is not possible because of this diagonal, and uh, you know this could develop, the knight would have to return. Now it could end up in a draw, but of course that's not what white would want. But alternatively, they could just go for a series of trades that would lead them to an endgame position, something like this, where in theory, white um, probably cannot convert this. I mean, black can hold if they're very accurate, but of course, the pawn structure here does not inspire much confidence in black's position, and they're gonna have to defend uh, quite tenaciously this endgame. So if we go back here, that is what happens if knight g4 is played, because bishop g5 would follow. So h6 was played, a very smart idea, preparing knight g4 while taking away the g5 square, for the bishop. And indeed, after c3, knight g4 followed. And this is a very nice strategical idea from Alareza, and I think this idea here does equalize the game. Uh, but of course, so many pieces left, so much interesting play remains. Now, one thing to realize, you might be wondering, why can't white just def over defend the bishop? And therefore, after this trade, the f file is open, they have the center, like we talked about before. Well, the difference, of course, is that the pieces that black has on the board are instead of having two knights, they have the two bishops. And this bishop, particularly on b6, is an absolute monster. The queen or some other piece is going to have to safeguard this e3 square for the foreseeable future because this bishop always exerts pressure. And further, the knight can maneuver, for example, to f4, utilizing the pin. And so the pieces that black have are far better suited to deal with this different pawn structure and therefore allowing knight takes e3 is not something you want to do and instead white was more or less forced here or at least strongly encouraged to take the bishop on b6 and we enter sort of a second stage in the game where we have a trade of the bishops but this knight being on g4 does come with the weaknesses that the center is less guarded and so the immediate d4 was played here taking advantage of that and a very interesting game will develop from this. The rook centralized for both players, the knight comes to f6 on its own, of course h3 is very logical to follow up, kicking the knight, so they return to f6, and here bishop to b5, with the big threat of going d5, utilizing the pin, that would end the game on the spot, so bishop d7 defends, and h3, a calm move, giving the king the square in h2, and as you will see, that does actually come into play a little later. Now, knight to e7, encourages a set of trades and from a strategical standpoint this is very good for alareza because the game now is more or less equal i mean white is arguably stronger in the center but the pieces are identical and in fact that becomes very clear when this series of knight maneuvers uh 
leaves the king side completely symmetrical. And it seems like no player will really be able to do damage. Um, however, Wesley So is forced to do damage. He has to win this game to move on. And so he goes uh, perhaps a little desperately for a kingside attack in this position. Again, he was very much forced to do so. So queen to d7, and here a big uh, mistake. After c4, the knight comes to h7, and queen to d2. Now this, of course, leaves the a4 pawn hanging, a simple blunder by Wesley, but it actually turned out to be an interesting mistake that I think helped um, him develop some sort of an attack. Because after this pawn is taken, what you'll notice is the rook is slightly offset, Black has focused a little bit on the queen side, and this gives white the opportunity to now put pressure on the king side. So we start with b3, the rook comes back, of course you don't really want to trade here and give white the control of the a file, so the rook returned to a6, but now after takes and knight takes, the knight can come to d4, and you can see that the f5 square is weak, and from this square, the dark squares over here begin to become a little shaky. So white is starting to gain some sort of initiative. Of course, they're down a pawn, so objectively they're worst. But I actually think this kind of played well into white's strategy because they have to win. So distracting the opponent's resources to the queen side gave white the ability to begin some sort of assault on the king side. So knight f6, the knight returns from h7, and here rook a to d1, just piling up on the center Again, saying, Black, you can have this queen side, this A-file. So indeed, knight to g6 and knight f5 follows. White is moving their pieces, mobilizing it to the king side. Rook a5, f4. Now, in these type of positions, you always need to consider the move knight takes e4, cutting the legs off of the knight on f5. Um, and for example, after rook takes, rook takes, obviously knight takes, and, and here the knight would be hanging. This would not actually be very good for white. However, white does have the nice shot, knight takes h6, giving away the knight, desperadoing it, because after pawn takes, you can now take the knight in the center, and you've won back the pawn that you lost in the center, and now the dark squares over here are very much telling. The immediate threat of knight f6 is obviously a colossal threat, obviously, also f f5 um, can come at the right moment with queen takes h6, knight g5 ideas. There are a lot of attacking possibilities here and in an armageddon game where black is down on time that is not something that alareza wants to allow so going back instead of taking on e4 queen c6 was played putting more pressure on that center square and after king h2 now alareza decides it's the right time to take because the queen is improved and the king has tucked itself away so both players have slightly improved their position and indeed we have knight takes e4 now you might be wondering, can we take on h6 like we did before? Of course, the answer is no, because now the knight is well guarded, so you can no longer win back the piece. So, going back, what did white have in mind? Well, the move here, queen d4. We put pressure on the g7 square. Obviously, the threat of mate is indeed uh, in front of us, so knight f6 is more or less forced, defending mate. But now, the simple rook takes on e8. Now, you might be wondering, can you not take now? Well, you can and if black were to take, you take here and you're very happy because, again, the structure is ruined. The issue is that black has this annoying move, king f8, where eventually the knight is going to be forced to come back to one of these squares. And in the resulting position, the structure here is very solid. Black is still up a pawn. Your attacking possibilities are, you know, black has basically survived the worst of it because you no longer have the dark square weaknesses that we did in some of the other variations and the attack begins to lose some of its steam. And so for this reason, Wesley So did not take on h6, and instead he opted to trade the rooks. Now, here, taking with the knight was absolutely necessary, because although you allow the rook to seize control of the e-file, and for example, after knight f6, you do still allow the move knight h6, but again, they're not going to take, they're going to sidestep, and we get a very similar position to before, where although the king might look weak, with the open e-file and the knight over here, there's no way to add pressure, and the pawn structure is very safe, the knights are good defenders, and it is black who is simply up a pawn and playing for the win here. So, going back, taking with the knight was important, instead taking with the queen was played, and this is a tactical mistake, it is a blunder, if you could call it that, and it allows white for a very strong tactical shot. So I'd urge you to pause the video if you're interested in trying to find it, 
Now, some people might be wondering, knight takes h6, but again, the king sidesteps. We see the story repeating itself again and again, where the king remains in a very solid configuration. You can win the pawn on h6, black is going to give that to you, but then the knight's going to have to at some point return, and you haven't done as much as maybe you thought. The white, black is still up upon, and we have the same situation. And instead, the correct strike was knight takes g7. Now, you give away the piece, it's not clear immediately how you're winning it back, but you notice a couple of things. The king and the knight are now connected. If the king were to ever move, the knight would fall, and so ideas of knight h5 and knight f5 become absolutely massive threats. And it is only this rook on a5 that is defending these two squares, so b4. And miraculously, the rook has nowhere to stay, so the rook is forced to abandon the fifth rank, but then knight f5 follows. Uh, you might be wondering, knight h5 seems maybe a bit better, but after the king moves, yes, both of these pieces are hitting the knight, but you can only take the knight with one piece. And after the queen takes, the knight is misplaced. It would prefer to be on f5, where it would uh, be a stronger piece in the attack. So knight to f5 was played, a stronger move, and here king f8, which is a mistake, and in this position, uh, white went on to win quite comfortably. We'll take a look at that in a moment. I wanted to show the last opportunity for black to try to defend and hold on, which is to go to king to h7, allowing the queen to sidestep to g8. You might be wondering, what's the idea? Can't the rook simply come to e1 with the idea of rook to e8 next, sacking the rook, but then mate will follow? The point is that rook takes g2 is possible. And you open up with the queen over here and the knight, you open up the king, now, the king can run away to the queen side, but the idea for black is to take a couple of pawns and then to take the knight and use that same knight to defend the king. And in the resulting endgame, it's a really interesting imbalance because white is up in exchange, but black has several pawns to compensate for that. Their king is very open, but now this white king is also open. And even though objectively white has the edge here with, for example, a move like rook to e7 or even rook e8, uh, trying to infiltrate along the eighth rank, Black would have better drawing chances here. This was the most tenacious defensive opportunity, but it was missed by Alareza. He instead sidestepped the, the king to f8, but after queen takes f6, the knight and the queen are a very strong attacking duo. There's a mate threat on g7, very hard to deal with. We had here a repetition, queen to e2, uh, and then check, queen comes back, queen comes back to f6. A repetition momentarily, but of course, Wesley is not here looking to end the game in a draw. He is winning and he knows it, so queen takes c7. Now, a final desperation here attempt by Alareza. He sacks the rook to try to open up the position with knight takes f4 with the queen coming in. But as long as Wesley is accurate and precise in these final moments, he is fine. So king to g3, a beautiful move he found. Now king f3 made a bit more sense to me instinctively because you're attacking the knight while not allowing, for example, any knight checks. But this would actually complicate things a little bit further because queen e2 is possible. Um, and you can see here that Wesley is so precise because he did not allow this. Um, and it would have been difficult here. You'd have to give away the knight with check and then run over. You are up a rook, but the king is exposed. And, you know, with the queen on the board, it's never over. And so he found the best opportunity, which is king to g3. Now there are no checks. The knight comes to h5, um, but after king f3, there are no checks whatsoever. Uh, white is up. A rook in this final position. The king is still unsafe. And Alareza either lost on time or he resigned. Both would have been acceptable because there is no surviving this position. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you're new around here. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace out.